Today, we're going to be explaining every single AD carry in the game and how you can increase your chances of beating them in Season 30. Whether you main AD carry or support or somewhere else entirely, hopefully this video can help you out when playing against these champions. We do also have individual counter pages on our website for every single champion too. So you can check it all out there and get a quick refresher even whilst you're in champion select. Now we just have to start off today's video with one of the most terrifying AD carries in the game, Draven. Draven is one of the best snowballing champions in the whole game and even more so when compared to any other AD carry. He's got huge damage in lane and if he gets a kill or two in the early game it can seem impossible to turn it around as let's be honest he just deals so much damage. The main reason for his ability to stomp and snowball is his passive. The more axes he catches, the more stacks he gets, and if he kills someone before he dies, he cashes in on those stacks in exchange for bonus gold. So, by far the most important thing when playing against Draven is always focus him, and always try to kill him as quickly as you can before he can kill someone first and claim that gold. His axes on his Q are where the majority of his damage comes from, but he actually does need to catch them to keep him active. If he fails to catch them and he doesn't have any axes ready, he's actually pretty weak. Now it's not too often a good Draven is going to miss those catches, but if he does, make sure you're looking to punish him. Speaking of punishing those axes, there's a way you can actually use them to your advantage. Now thankfully you can see where he's going to move to catch the next axe, so when playing skillshot champions like Ezreal, you can use this opportunity to land free poke against him. Or if you're playing a CC support like Blitzcrank, you can line up those hooks when he goes to catch them. You're also going to need to be careful of his E, which is where he throws a fan of axes in a line. Now the damage is negligible, but it's mainly used for its brief CC. This can completely interrupt certain champions dashes and gap closers, so if you're playing someone like Tristana, it can stop your rocket jump. Always try to bait it out first before using that mobility spell, whether that's escaping or chasing him down to kill him. Draven also has an attack speed and movement speed steroid in his W. This allows him to kite or to chase and every time he catches his Q, it resets that W's cooldown. If he spams this ability though, it does burn through his mana, especially in the early game before he's got that Essence Reaver. You have no mana! So if he is overusing this and wasting all his mana, fight him, because an out of mana Draven with no axes is like a dragon who can't fly, or breathe fire, or claw you to death, well, you get the idea. Draven also has a global ultimate, so be careful of him using this to cash in on his passive from around the map. Just like any global ultimate, don't recall on low health in any obvious places and throw your teammates a few warning pings if you see him trying to snipe them across the rift. It's important to know that Draven's ultimate goes out and then comes back again, so if it hits you right on the tip as he recalls it, it will seriously hurt. And if you can't dodge both parts, make sure you avoid at least one of them. Throughout games, Draven basically either stomps or doesn't really do that much. If he gets behind, he's going to be a little bit useless, but it's all about just not letting him run riot in the lane phase. He has pretty low range and team fights, so with a bit of CC, some burst, and some of these tips we've mentioned in this video, you should have a much better chance of beating him. Oh, and by the way, Draven mains seem to be some of the more, let's say, fragile-minded solo key players, so if they don't go 10-0, they might just go 0-10. Next up, we've got one of the most oppressive AD carries in the game that everybody thinks they are a god on, Caitlyn. So, the most blatant strength of Caitlyn is that long auto attack range, and her ability to shove, poke, and just basic attack you down so that you can't play the game. Controlling waves and preventing her from pushing in is something you just really need to be doing against her. If she is pushing you in, try and keep the minions just outside your tower range, so that she won't be able to abuse you whilst you're trying to farm under your turret. This will also leave her in the perfect position for your jungler to come in and punish her. After a certain amount of basic attacks, Caitlyn's next auto becomes a headshot, dealing significantly more damage. When she's got her headshot auto ready, there's a sound cue and a slightly different animation. So simply just back off, let her use it on a minion instead, and then carry on. If she's attacking from the brush, she gets those headshots more often though, so don't let her sit in those lane brushes and attack you for free. The scary part of this headshot passive though is when you step into her trap or you get hit by her 90 caliber net. This not only gives her an additional headshot against you, but it also gives her a massive range increase too for nearly 2 seconds. This is why it's imperative that you avoid those nets and traps as often as you can. Talking of those traps, the most common way for Caitlyn to use these against you is by layering them on top of her teammate's CC. If you get hit by a Lux Q for example and you don't have cleanse available, you're going to get trapped and deleted very quickly. Always be extra careful in lanes like this one, and if they miss those bindings, this is your chance to fight them. When Caitlyn is pushing you in under your tower, she can place her traps in locations hidden behind or beside the turret. This is why it's even more punishing getting pushed in by her, because if you forget about that trap when you go for farm, you may get exploded instantly. Once the lane resets and Caitlyn is far enough away, absorb those traps and clear them when you can, or just let them time out. 
Caitlyn's Q deals some hefty damage. Now she usually maxes this ability first and it deals more damage to the first enemy it passes through. After that, it deals 50% less damage to enemies hit afterwards. All you gotta do for this one is stand behind your minions and tank your teammates to make sure she doesn't get that full damage off on you. One thing to note though is if you step into her trap, her Q will also always hit you for its full damage. So her burst damage can be a bit crazy with this combo. Speaking of combos, Caitlyn's most common one is her EQ auto combo. Caitlyn's net is her only real form of mobility, but it's quite often used for damage in fights. If you sidestep her net, she'll deal significantly less damage to you. You need to be really careful when you're chasing in a straight line into Caitlyn. Her E will send her straight backwards away from you, but also hit you with her net at the same time, allowing her to burst you as well. If she does use or waste her net aggressively though, this means she's now extremely punishable. So don't be afraid to use this chance to get stuck in and take her down. Obviously, we just have to mention Caitlyn's ultimate as well. She locks onto you and after a brief channel, she fires a homing bullet which can be blocked by allied champions. Now, my best advice when trying to get a teammate to save you with this one is to get close to them and just stand still. The more you move, the more your teammate moves and the more chances you have of messing it up and feeling like a complete plonker. Caitlyn's oppressive early game is definitely one to be careful about, but thankfully her mid game is pretty poor. If she gets behind in the early game, she's going to be nearly useless during that mid game and she won't be doing much until the late game instead. She will mainly look to rotate for plates and towers as the lane phase ends, but if you constantly force fights against her while she's in that slightly weaker mid game, you'll have a much better chance of beating her before she really scales into that late game monster. Next up, we have one of the most banned AD carries in the game, which is Samira. Samira is all about aggression and snowballing. She has some outrageously nasty duo combos alongside champions with strong engaging CC. Nautilus and Rel are fantastic examples. Now the main reason behind this is that Samira can actually piggyback onto her support CC with her passive. She will dash towards the immobilized target, extend the CC if it's knock up with a brief knock up of her own and deal some extra damage. Then she'll be in range to combo the rest of her abilities and yeah, you get the point. All we can say is make sure you're showing some extra respect in these matchups where she can really abuse this. One of Samira's best abilities is her win more mechanic in her W. Although instead of placing it down like Yasuo does, it goes around her character instead. This is a huge defensive cooldown and playing around this ability is key to beating her. Now she won't typically take it until level 3 so you do have that window to punish her before then. But once she does have it, you need to constantly think about it when you're fighting her. And as soon as she uses it or wastes it, now's your time to kill her. One of the scariest things about Samira though is her level 6 power spike. And generally the AoE damage and sustain her ultimate grants her in fights. But the thing is she can't just press R at the start. She has to charge up her passive by getting stacks of style. She gains these stacks by spacing out auto attacks and abilities. And you can see what stack she's on by looking at her nameplate. It goes from E, D, C, B, A and then when it's at S she's got her ultimate ready. Samira can combo her abilities together quickly to get those stacks, but if she messes up or you dodge part of this combo, she won't actually be able to press R. Try and factor this in when fighting her and always be mindful of when she can press it. If she's got that passive stacked and ready to go and you see that S icon, get out of there and try again a bit later. Even pre-6, those stacks of style will still help her though, as she gains bonus movement speed for each style of stack she's got up, so be careful. Now aside from combos, wind walls, her passive and her ultimate, there's one more big thing that makes Samira very scary, her mobility. Samira's E is her dash and this ability resets upon champion takedowns. So in team fights, if she's popping off with her ultimate, she can repeatedly dash with that E to clean up fights in a matter of seconds. You need to be extra careful of this happening and if you have any crowd control, you'll need to lock her down as quickly as you can. One other thing to note about her E though is that it's a fixed distance dash. Now this means she can use it in a number of different ways. She can engage and chase with it, or she can angle herself through you to actually dash away to safety. So always try to avoid giving her an escape angle when trying to take her down. The fourth AD carry we're going to cover today is of course, Jin. Jin is a pretty unique marksman with his 4 shot ammo system and his long range pick potential. He tends to fare well throughout most stages of games, with a strong lane phase, a snowball mid game and a very scary amount of late game burst damage. In lane, one of the first things you've got to think about is his passive. When he has that fourth shot ready, respect it. Simply let him waste it on a minion before you go back into range. It is worth noting too that he can extend the duration of that fourth shot timeout by using his other abilities. Jin's ammo system can also be a bit of a problem for him though. He lacks the consistent DPS that most AD carries have, as he simply can't auto attack until he's reloaded. As soon as you see him burn that fourth shot, you'll know you have a few seconds to now fight him without too much retaliation. 
Then you've also got his Q, which is a grenade that bounces from target to target. He'll usually use this on the minion wave and it'll bounce up to three additional times. If he kills a minion with this grenade, it will do 35% more damage when it hits you. And this can seriously hurt, especially once he's got a bit of AD under his belt. Always be careful of those back minions that are low on health, and if you see him use it on the wave, back off for a second and don't let it bounce to you. You're also going to need to be careful of walking into Jin's traps. He puts lotus flowers on the floor, and if you walk into them, they'll slow and reveal you and deal damage when they explode. He'll usually put these down in areas outside of the minion wave's path thing. So be extra careful when warding or checking those brushes, as he may be ready and waiting to follow that up with his W. Speaking of that W, this is his long range sniping ability that will root you if it lands, but only if you're already marked. If he or his teammate hits you with an auto attack or ability, you'll be marked for 4 seconds. And if he lands that W during this time, you're going to get rooted. So keep an eye out for that mark on top of you and respect it. You also want to be careful of Jin layering this CC with his W on top of his support stuns, so get ready to time that cleanse perfectly to stay alive. One last thing to mention quickly about Jin's E traps as well is that whenever Jin kills an enemy, a trap will actually spawn on their corpse. So be really careful in those 2v2s if your teammate does die, and don't get hit by it. Obviously, we have to talk about Jin's ultimate as well, and I'm sure most of you know about this one. He fires four long range shots that slow you, and the fourth shot always crits. So make sure you always put on your dancing shoes and avoid these if you can. Don't forget that all you gotta do is hide behind your teammates or rush to the edge of the zone and get out of the way. As the game progresses, Jin will be darting in and out of fights, popping down enemies around his ammo system and his burst. If he crits, he gains movement speed, so he can be pretty hard to lock down once he's got a few items. The thing is though, Jin doesn't actually have any dashes, and especially if his gale force is down, he's really easy to punish if you can get close enough. He also shows the whole map where he is when he presses R, so you can use this time to lock him down and take him out. Next up, we've got Ezreal. Now, Ezreal is one of the safest AD carries you can pick pretty early in Champion Select, and he always has his place in any draft. This is largely due to his unrivaled mobility with his E. He basically has another flash, and this means he can be very difficult to punish if he reserves it and uses it defensively. If he does use it recklessly though, he's just as easy to shut down as anyone else. Now, despite him being a really safe pick, he's also probably the most inconsistent AD carry out there, because he's completely and utterly skill shot reliant. If he lands every ability, he's going to 1v9, but if he struggles and misses frequently, he's probably going to deal no damage. Ezreal's bread and butter ability is his Q, Mystic Shot. This applies on hit effects like Muramana, it procs his Sheen, which is why Spellblade items have always been so damn strong on him. And with that 2-3 item pass spike, this ability seriously packs a punch. Luckily for you though, in lane, he actually can't hit you with it if you're just chilling behind the minion wave. Don't space away from the wave too much and don't take unnecessary poke from this ability, and already you'll have a much better time against him. Ezreal's W locks onto you and then he can proc it with his other abilities or auto attacks. If he uses his E aggressively to proc it though, this is a great time to punish him. If he does proc his W with his E or his Q, it refunds mana for him. So remember that if you think you can punish him because of his low mana, if he lands this and refunds it, he might surprise you. Just like any champion with a global ultimate, you need to be careful of those long range snipes. Be careful recalling under your tower on low health and warn your teammates if you see him use it across the map. The other thing about Ezra's ultimate is it's his best way to stack up his passive. If he hits targets with his abilities, he gets up to 5 stacks of bonus attack speed, so he'll often use this early on in fights to stack it and then go ham. Ezreal players also have a tendency to hide in the fog of war when casting it as well, so keep those lane brushes warded to avoid a pretty nasty surprise. Ezreal may be a cheeky lane bully and offer tons of poke, but he's not that great in 1v1s and duels. If you're playing someone like Vayne or Kaiser who can press R and just run him down when you get a chance, don't be afraid to commit. As the game goes on, Ezreal can deal a huge amount of damage, especially in the mid game where he should have his main pass spike with Muramana kicking in. The thing about Ezreal though is not letting him play to his strengths. He's one of those champions that loves to play right on the edge, he's never going to deal as much damage as a Jinx if you commit onto him, and he can only really damage one target at a time. If you stay behind your frontline and let those tanks take those mystic shots, he's just not going to be able to do too much to you. However, if you let him stay out of range and poke you down, you're probably going to regret it. Moving on to Kaiser, who's probably one of the most popular AD carries in the game. So let's take a look at how to actually play against her. Kaiser has everything an AD carry needs. Wave clear, burst damage, poke, mobility and self peel. So you will need to understand where all of these strengths come from if you're going to want to beat her on a regular basis. Kaiser's passive, Plasma, is what brings her so much burst and gives her the ability to shred through any type of target, even tanks. Basically, she applies Plasma with basic attacks and her W, but her teammate's crowd control also applies stacks too. 
When she consumes the fifth stack, she deals bonus magic damage based on the target's missing health, which is where so much of her early kill threat comes from. This makes it especially important to avoid her teammate's CC in those early 2v2s, because if she can't make use of that passive, she will deal significantly less damage. Kaisa's W provides two stacks of plasma, so dodging that is key to making sure she can't burst you down. Speaking of that W, it's a pretty long range skill shot that's mainly used for its damage, its poke, and honestly just what we've just mentioned, extra burst alongside a passive. And to avoid it, just sit behind your teammate or your minion wave and you'll be just fine. If Kaisa does snipe you with her W from a distance though, this will allow her to dive on top of you with her ultimate. She can dash to or through any enemy affected by her plasma passive. So what she'll often do is wait for you to be in a vulnerable position, hit that W and dive in with her ultimate to take you down. If you're playing someone that's a bit weak in 1v1, she's almost always going to beat you here. This ultimate is her main form of mobility, and in fights throughout the lane, team fights, you name it, this is her main get out of jail free card. It's a really quick dash, and she can use it in unique angles to get out of really tricky situations. Try to avoid fighting near walls as she can dash through and over you, over the wall, and escape at the same time. This ability is actually interruptible though. Now it's very quick so it's not an easy one, but just like most other dashes, time your CC or your anti-mobility spells at the right time and she can't do anything but accept her fate. In lane, Kaisa's main trading ability is her Q, which is a fantastic form of wave clip. She can destroy those early waves with it and farm her tower with it really well too. Be mindful of her ability to quickly clean up a few minions, hit that level advantage and start to fight with her support. If you're playing an AD carry with low wave clear, you might find it tough to get level 2 first, so throw in some more auto attacks and abilities than usual to prevent this from happening. Aside from her E granting her a boost of movement speed and some attack speed after the charge up, there's one major other thing you need to think about when playing against Kai'Sa. Every champion and every AD carry has big power spikes, but Kai'Sa's are even more brutal due to the second part of her passive which allows her to evolve her basic abilities. Each one of her abilities is upgradable when she meets certain numbers of stats. Her Q will now fire 12 missiles up from 6, making it hurt a ton more. She evolves this with a certain amount of AD. Her Evolve W applies 3 plasma up from 2, and refunds the majority of its cooldown when it hits an enemy champion. However, she'll need to have a certain amount of AP to evolve this one, which is a slightly more unconventional way to build her. Her Evolved E grants invisibility when she casts it, which now makes her so much harder to keep track of. And to evolve this ability, she needs a certain amount of attack speed. So you can see just how much more threatening she can be once she's evolved those abilities. Her Q seriously hurts now and that E stealth can make her so much more difficult to shut down. Make sure you're keeping a careful eye on her item spikes because these directly tie into her evolutions. If she's got that big AD item, if she's got her attack speed ready, she's going to be much harder to deal with. Do not get baited into engaging onto her for her to simply stealth out to safety and now you're a sitting duck in the middle of her enemy team. Let's move on to everybody's favourite troublemaker, Jinx. Jinx is a scaling hyper carry with one of the scariest ways to clean up fights in the entire game with her passive resets. Her AoE team fighting damage is incomparable and her long range, movement speed and burst is immense when she gets those main items. In lane though, Jinx is super vulnerable, she's really not too strong here and if you can punish her during the lane phase before she gets those major items, you can set her so far back that she'll never really kick into gear. Now let's talk about the biggest thing first which is her passive, when she kills a tower, inhib, epic monster or enemy champion she gains a ton of movement speed that decays over 6 seconds. She also gains loads of attack speed too though and is temporarily allowed to exceed the attack speed gap. So whether it's during the lane phase in those tense 2v2s or in big late game team fights, denying her those resets is one of your biggest priorities to think about. Jinx has two weapons, which she switches between with her Q. You've got her minigun which is her standard auto attack, which gives her a little attack speed steroid to maintain as long as she keeps auto attacking. Then you've got her rocket launcher, which reduces her attack speed slightly and costs mana every time she auto attacks. However, it increases her range, damage and deals AoE splash damage. Now you can simply tell which one she's got equipped by just looking at her, but also with sound cues too. Keep your eyes open and make sure you know how far she can attack you from. And remember, if she's out of mana, she's only going to be relying on that minigun. Jinx's W and her ultimate give her some fantastic ranged sniping potential and burst damage. Her W is a simple long range skill shot shock blast that deals damage but you can block this with minions and allied champions. Her ultimate though is global range and it deals more damage based on the travel distance and based on her enemy's missing health. Just like all global ultimates, make sure you're being careful when recalling on low health and make sure your teammates are aware of this threat too. A simple ping or two can really make the difference here. This huge rocket also deals AoE damage but the majority of the damage is done to the primary target. 
One of the other parts of Jinx's kit we haven't mentioned yet is her chompers. She throws out these three little flame chompers at a location that will arm after a brief delay. These will explode and deal damage if they don't hit anyone, but if they do hit someone they will instantly deal damage and root them. Jinx will often place this in your expected pathing, so always be ready for them and seriously, be careful if you land in them. If you get trapped she can follow that with her W and her ultimate and deal a huge amount of burst damage. Just like most other AD carries with some CC, she will often try and stack this ability alongside her support CC too. So just try and remember how punishing this can be if you get chained down, and don't hesitate to cleanse if you need to. Jinx is the definition of a ticking time bomb. You've got time in the lane phase to punish her and put her behind. And due to the fact she has no dashes, if you do invest time into shutting her down in the early game, she may never recover. On the flip side though, if she does get fed here, she's going to snowball insanely hard. And once she's got those core items, she can roll over entire teams from extremely far away. Make sure Jinx is always your focus in teamfights and do not leave her unchecked. If she is allowed to go mad from that backline, you're just not going to have too much fun against her, especially if she's got a support like Lulu by her side. Next up, we've got Ash. Now, Ash is a relatively simple AD carry in principle, but she does actually require really good mechanics and kiting to play at a high level. She will always be useful because of her ultimate, but if she does get behind, she'll literally just be playing Sniper Simulator. In lane, Ash will mainly be looking to poke you down with her volley. Now, you can hide behind minions to avoid getting hit by it, and it's as simple as that. If she does stack up her Q though, she can use this to deal more damage to you and repeatedly slow you with her passive, so you will need to be careful not to get caught out by this. Ash is fairly unique in the way that her passive works because she doesn't actually deal any more damage when she crits you, but her slow strength is doubled. Consider picking up items with slow resistance and just be super cautious of letting her constantly apply it and keep kiting. Ash's Hawkshot allows her to scout the jungle as well, which means she can use this to track your jungler's whereabouts, and then she can adjust her playstyle depending on what information she gets from it. You do want to try and punish her when she gains nothing from using it though. If she has no idea where your jungler is, this means you can play mind games with her. You can look to fake a gank, you can look to set up a gank easier, or just get some more lane control out of it. By far the most identifiable part of Ash's kit though is that enchanted crystal arrow. This ability's usage determines how Ash's game will actually go, and from as early as level 5 you need to be respecting it and remember that if she does ding 6 before you, she's probably going to instantly use it. If you have any dashes, do not use them until she's pressed R. If you don't have dashes, save your flash or your cleanse for it instead. Ash's ultimate also stuns for longer if it's travelled a larger distance up to a maximum of 3.5 seconds. Be extra careful when you're pushing a tower farming plates because when she resets or spawns, she can send the arrow down the lane and if you get hit, you can honestly just die to the tower or a teammate's coming along too. Aside from all of that, the later the game goes on, the better Ash gets. Naturally, she's an AD carry so obviously she's going to do better with items. But she kites more effectively, she shreds all types of targets and if she's got a lot of peel alongside her, she can also be extremely difficult to shut down. Just remember though, she has no dashes, so keep track of her flash, engage on her with some heavy CC, and you'll be just fine. Next up, we have the Zumi Zappi Zeri, who's all about kiting and darting in and out of fights and throwing out relentless DPS. She scales like a beast, and you really have to pick champions with reliable crowd control to actually shut her down. In the early levels though, Zeri really isn't that strong. Her Q works as her auto attack, but it can easily be blocked by minions and allies. So first things first, whenever you're fighting in lane, you can actually use this to your advantage very easily. Zeri farms under tower very well though because of her Q and her basic attack passive. She charges it up over time and then it gets empowered and deals bonus damage, so it can be very straightforward. This means you do want to avoid just AFK pushing her under her tower and letting her scale up and farm for free. You're going to be much better off keeping the lane in a position where you can try and kill her often pre-6. One of the biggest things about Zeri is her mobility with her E. Now this is something she can use very aggressively or defensively depending on the situation, but without her E, she's much easier to kill. Whenever you're trying to fight her, try and keep her away from walls so she can't use these to easily escape. You can interrupt this if you time it right too, so if you do have some CC, be ready to use it. Due to Zeri's E, you also want to be careful of places where she can dive over walls to engage on you, especially in situations or scenarios where you're pushing ready to base and she's already got back and ready to kill you. Think of it a little bit similar to a Kai'Sa diving onto you and forcing a 1v1 with her ultimate, because Zeri can basically do the same, especially if she has her ultimate up. Speaking of Zeri's ultimate, this is a massive power spike for her, and she's so much better in 2v2 fights and duels from level 6 onwards. So before we even talk about the ability, make sure you're considering fighting her in those early levels beforehand, because in a lot of matchups, you should have the upper hand. Zeri's ultimate deals decent AoE burst damage on cast, and then she gains bonus attack speed and movement speed, and her Q is empowered too. 
because now she deals AoE splash lightning damage to nearby enemies that she attacks, and she can extend the duration of all of this by continuing to keep attacking you. When she presses R, you have two options. Option number one is throw everything you have at her and burst her down as soon as possible. Option number two is get out of there, give her some space, let that ultimate time out, and then look to fight her while it's on cooldown. If Zeri manages to keep those ultimate stacks charged up in teamfights, her movement will keep climbing to the point where she will feel impossible to hit with anything. So in teamfights, the same rules apply. Kill her first or wait out that ultimate, or she will turn into the ultimate dodgeball champion. There are a few other things to mention about Zeri too. Her passive allows her to absorb the enemy of shields that she damages, and when she gains a shield, she gains 10% movement speed. So be extra careful throwing random shields out, because this could actually give her an opening to engage on you. Zeri also has some good poke with her W which extends in range and damage when she uses it over walls or towers. If she passed slightly weird by the terrain, just be ready to sidestep. She can also combine this W with her dash and her ultimate and pop them all at the same time as she's flying over terrain. So watch out for this one as it's a pretty scary sight. And if you're not a good duelist, you're probably going to get slapped. Generally speaking, Zeri needs to be crowd control. She relies heavily on movement speed to kite and keep doing what she does best. So outside of the lane phase, you need to lock her down as soon as possible. And once you do, she shouldn't be too much of a problem. Try to punish her in the lane phase as much as you can, especially pre-6. And if you can stop her getting to that three item power spike, you're going to have a much better chance of beating her. For our next champion, I've got a question for you. What's heavier, a kilogram of feathers or a kilogram of steel? It's Zaya. Now, first things first, obviously, we're going to have to start with those feathers we just mentioned. She spreads feathers by using her Q and also with auto attacks after using abilities. These feathers scatter around the floor and she can then use her E to rake them back in. Now her E is usually the ability she maxes first and it's where a lot of her burst damage comes from. So before you even think of anything else, always keep an eye on those feather placements on the floor because if you forget about them and she uses her E, it's not only going to really hurt but it'll also CC you as well. It's also worth noting that Zaya can reposition herself with her flash or gale force and then press E to find obscure angles to catch you off guard. Just remember though, when Zaya's E is down, her CC is down and so is her burst damage. So if she misses it, now's the time to fight her. Zaya's Q is a poking skill shot that she'll use to generate more feathers and combo alongside her E. Simply just watch out for the animation with this one and just try and dodge it. Now you can't hide behind minions to avoid it, but it will deal half the damage after it hits the first target. Zaya also has a really strong level one and generally early all in due to her W. Now what this does is it grants her a chunk of attack speed, movement speed, and empowers her attacks to strike a second time for 20% damage. Zaya players will often look for an early cheese all in, especially if they're pre-made with Rakan, because he will also become unpowered with her W. Be super careful of those lane brushes level 1 and don't just assume they're leashing for their jungler because they could be ready to pounce and burn your summoner spells early. Zaya's ultimate is probably one of the best self peeling abilities in the game for any AD carry. She leaps into the air, becomes untargetable and throws out a fan of feathers in a cone that deal damage. If she then presses her E after using her ultimate, that's a lot of feathers that are going to deal a lot of AoE damage and potentially CC entire enemy teams as well, so make sure you respect it. You really want to avoid using your big skill shots before she presses her ultimate, or she can dodge all of what you throw at her. Try to force her to use her ultimate before sending in the cavalry, and remember, once it's on cooldown, she's so much easier to punish. The cooldown of her ultimate is fairly long in the early game as well, so it can be a great time to take her out while she's waiting for it to come back up. So against Zaya to sum up, it's key that you keep an eye on those feather placements, punish her when she misses her E, and try to fight her around her ultimate's cooldown. If you do these things consistently, you should be fine. Oh, and by the way, in case you were wondering, a kilogram of feathers and a kilogram of steel both wear the same, obviously. I don't get it. Next up, we've got Neela, and she is a super unique marksman that's basically limited to melee range, and abusing this is key to beating her on a regular basis. If Neela misses her Q, which is her whip, she is literally melee range. So before you think about anything else, always bully her every single time she misses it. She'll use it often to farm and to poke, but if she does hit it, she'll gain extended range and her auto attacks will deal splash damage. And because of this, she'll often have a tendency to push that lane often, which means she's only going to invite ganks. Neela's E can also be combined with her Q to deal a little cheeky damage combo, so watch out for that one. Speaking of Neela's E, this is her dash, and it's a fixed distance dash just like Samira's E or Yasuo's E. But this one has two charges. If she uses both of these charges wastefully to engage, to poke, or to escape, she literally has no mobility. So why not use this perfect time to take her out? Neela's passive is pretty huge, and it has two parts. The first part is that her and her support will get more experience than the average bot lane, because they will gain an additional 50% of the experience they would have lost from sharing. So what you need to understand is that when playing against Neela, they will often get those big level ups sooner than you do. So be very careful of those early all-ins, especially around level 2, level 3, and level 6. The second part of her passive is that Neela gains more healing and shielding, plus the support that cast them on her also gains a smaller version of that effect too. 
Now there's not really too much you can do about this aside from getting some itemization to counter it a bit later on. Apart from that, just remember that it actually exists and respect it, especially in lanes with supports who can really utilize it like Jana or Seraphine. Neela's W is an ability which she'll usually take at level 3. Now this is a massive defensive cooldown that she can use to completely counter certain lanes. And what it does is it surrounds herself in mist for 2.25 seconds giving her movement speed, reduced magic damage taken, and finally the most important part, it dodges all non-turret basic attacks. This can counter loads of different abilities like Nautilus's auto attack CC, Braum's passive, Blitzcrank's E, Yasuo's Q, Leona's Q stun, and basically anything that counts as an auto attack. Neela also can share this effect with nearby allies if she collides with them, but for a reduced time of 1.5 seconds. Honestly, playing around this defensive ability is absolutely key to beating her, especially in those early 2v2s. Maybe you want to try and fight her level 2 before she unlocks it, maybe you can bait it out and re-engage afterwards, but just don't forget about it and use all of your cooldowns on it or you're probably going to lose the fight. Finally, Neela's ultimate is an AoE CC and damaging ability that heals her and her teammates near her based on the damage dealt to enemy champions. Now it's kind of like a smaller Orianna ultimate which groups enemies together, and it can be incredibly strong when combined with other supports ultimates like Leona or Seraphine. You're going to need to be extra careful when she hits level 6 because it's a fantastic tool for her to engage with. But also, don't forget that if she uses both dashes to get towards you, she won't be able to chase you afterwards. Flash or dodge this ability if you can to prevent her from healing and then get stuck back in and take her down. Overall, Neela can be very scary in the right hands, but she's a very one-dimensional champion. She can seem somewhat unkillable with her healing and shielding, but realistically, if you don't get sucked into constantly fighting her, you can keep her at bay, continuously outrange and bully her, and take her down around those major cooldowns. Next up, we've got Vayne, who packs some of the highest single target DPS in the game. She's got stealth, mobility, self-peel, and tons of damage too. But she does take some practice to play optimally. Now, before we even look at Vayne's kit, the most important thing to note when playing against Vayne is to make sure she's put behind in the early game. She's vulnerable to poke, to hard engage, and basically anything you throw at her in those early levels. So if you invest time into putting her behind, she is going to struggle to get going. Now, this is the case with most AD carries, but if you let a Vayne free farm in the weakest part of her game, you're probably going to regret it. So let's talk about Vayne's ultimate first, which is key to her ability to kite and do the things that she does best. It gives her more damage, more movement speed from her passive, but the key thing is it reduces the cooldown of her tumble, and it grants her stealth every time she queues. In team fights, this ability will allow her to navigate fights, kite back, chase, dodge incoming abilities, and keep herself alive. But without it, she is no way near as threatening. If Vayne does use her ultimate prematurely, just back off, wait for it to time out, and then try to force a fight while it's on cooldown. Vayne's tumble is a short distance dash on a relatively low cooldown. She'll use this to dodge abilities in the lane phase and play around it to trade. However, if she wastes it, this is the time to fight her. To add to that, good Vayne players will rarely tumble towards you in a straight line. They should dash diagonally as they chase, but if they don't, easy skill shots and free kills. As Vayne is a duelist, she relies solely on single target DPS to do her thing. This means she's always going to struggle against multiple targets, especially without her ultimate. In most matchups, you probably don't want to try and 1v1 a vein, unless you're really far ahead or you have the summoner spell advantage. Her silver bolts on her W are a large part of this, and you can avoid these in lane to prevent her winning out on trades. If she attacks you twice and you see those rings on you, back off, let her hit a minion, and then go back in and carry on. You've also got to be extremely careful about playing near walls when fighting against Vayne. If she has the opportunity to stun you with her condemn into terrain, it's usually enough for her to win those duels. Always try to fight her in open lanes and make sure she doesn't have the angle on you. Don't forget that Vayne can also E flash too, so just because you think you're safe, make sure this isn't an option either. Vayne's Condemn can also proc her silver box, so be careful of her burst damage with that one. In the mid to late game when Vayne has her core items, this is where she'll really come online. However, if you have some reliable CC, make sure you throw it on her as soon as possible, and she shouldn't be too much of a problem. If you're struggling to track her during teamfights because of those stealthy tumbles, grab yourself an oracle lens to help keep on top of her. And of course, just like any marksman, especially scaling ones, don't forget to focus them down first. Next up, we've got Lucian, and he's all about those dashes and burst damage and looking cool as hell whilst doing it. Lucian is a bit of a bully in lane with his aggressive nature and his ability to snowball very quickly. But if he doesn't, he doesn't really scale too well into games, and it can be very difficult for him to be impactful in teamfights due to his low range. So rule number one against Lucian, don't risk giving him that early lead that allows him to really play to his strengths. Lucian's burst comes from his passive and his Q. His Q is a line skill shot that he can hit you with by aiming it on minions in the same line of fire. Try to avoid getting hit by this for free, so just keep an eye on your positioning, his positioning and the wave as well. Lucian's passive means that after he casts an ability, he gains an additional shot on attack, so like a double hit. If he spaces out his abilities in a short window, he can deal significant damage really quickly. 
every time he uses an ability try to outrange him and force him to use that double hit on minions instead. You probably know about the infamous Lucian Nami combo, but what makes that combo so strong is the second part of Lucian's passive. As whenever he's healed, shielded or buffed by a support, his next two shots are also empowered to deal bonus damage on hits. So when combined with Nami's E burst damage is what made it slap so hard. If Lucian is playing alongside supports who can buff him and abuse this, you'll need to show them some extra respect in the early game. Don't let them get those level ups before you and force fights, try to control the waves you stay even or ahead and keep some space between you and him to keep the lane in control and to keep Lucian at bay. Lucian's ultimate is pretty easy to play against though. It's a channel damaging ability where he rapidly fires in a target direction and he can't change that direction during its cast. The best way to counter this ability is just by blocking it with allied minions or your support if they're feeling like a hero. Now Lucian can dash to reposition this ultimate though, whether that's forward to chase you or sideways as you try to flash away. But your best bet is to simply block it with your friends, or outrange it if you can. If Lucian does use his W and then his ultimate, he'll gain bonus movement speed towards you as well, so watch out for that one. So the moral of the story is this, respect his early Orlins, give him some space as well as the support if they're playing an aggressive matchup, and just mainly focus on outscaling him in the majority of games. Lucian is also fairly mana hungry early game, so you can use this to your advantage to win lane. In team fights, Lucian has a fair bit of mobility due to his auto attack reducing his dash's cooldown. But due to his low range, if you can lock him down when he gets a bit too close, he should go down pretty easily. Lucian is also not the best duelist, so if you're playing someone who excels in 1v1s, dodge his Q and ruin his day. Let's move on to Varus now, and he has a ton of different builds and itemization options to go for. He can build AD on hit, AD lethality, or even AP carry. But either way, let's see if we can help you beat him more often. So Varus has various different ways to win trades throughout the lane phase, from his poke, his passive, and his all-in potential once he gets level 6. The first thing you need to think about is his passive, where he gains a burst of attack speed after killing a unit. When he combines this with any runes like Lethal Tempo or Hail of Blades, it can be very strong, so try to fight him before he kills any minions. And take a look at his runes too before you decide to flip an early fight against him. In lane, Varus will try to poke you down with his Q and his E. His Q is a charged line skill shot, so when he's charging up, try to sidestep it to avoid free damage. This ability deals the same damage through minions, so sitting behind them won't actually help you here. If he empowers his Q by pressing his W though, it will deal bonus magic damage and it deals more damage based on the target's missing health. Make sure you're keeping on your toes because if this one hits, it's gonna hurt. Don't forget though that you can actually interrupt Varus' Q though before he finishes casting it. So if you time your CCs or silences right whilst he's charging, you won't even need to worry about dodging it. Charging up his Q also slows him down too, which makes him easier for you to hit with your own skill shots and your CC. Varus's E is a rain of arrows that doesn't really deal too much damage on its own, but this ability slows and also applies grievous wounds. So if you have taken summon a heal, try to use it before this ability or after the effects end. Now it's not just poke with Varus though, because his W's passive applies stacks of blight. These stack up to three times and Varus' abilities will consume them to deal bonus magic damage. You really need to keep an eye on those blight stacks on top of you and respect his ability to proc them with that E and Q as this is where a ton of his damage comes from in extended fights. One thing that people also forget about Varus though is that when he consumes those blight stacks against champions or epic monsters, his basic ability cooldowns are significantly reduced. This means his DPS can be immense throughout fights, especially when partnered with his passive which grants him bursts of attack speed, and he can tear through all types of enemy with his max and missing health damage on his W. So don't underestimate his damage and remember that he also shreds through objectives too, so watch out for those cheeky sneaky Baron calls. Finally, there's one of the best things about Varus, which is his ultimate. And for an AD carry, this amount of CC and initiation is pretty damn significant. It is a skill shot that infects the first champion it hits, dealing a bit of damage and rooting them for two seconds while spreading to nearby enemies too. Always be ready and careful when Varus hits level 6, as it's a fantastic initiation tool to set up fights and ganks in the bot lane. If you get hit by the support CC, he'll chain this ability alongside it and vice versa. So it is definitely worth flashing or cleansing it if you can. If Varus does miss or waste that ultimate though, he is now super easy to punish. So do not be afraid to bait out that ability and then go for the takedown afterwards. Don't forget that Varus' ultimate also applies max stacks of blight to all enemies it hits, which means Varus can now deal huge damage with those Qs and Es afterwards. And if he's AP Varus, that WQ combo alongside that ultimate is where those one shots happen. Overall, Varus is one of the rare AD carries that can decide when and how he wants to fight. He can initiate fights with his ultimate, or he can sit back and contribute just whenever he wants to. Generally speaking though, you want to avoid his poke, dodge that ultimate at all costs, and get on top of him up close and personal. As we've said already, he literally has no mobility. So if he has no flash, he's going to be super easy to kill, if he missteps for any reason. Moving on to one of the more unique AD carries in the game, which is Callista. 
Callista is all about kiting and jumping around the bot lane, dodging everything that comes her way and snowballing exceptionally quickly. So the way that Callista kites is based around her auto attack, with every attack she can dash and the speed of these dashes scales with her attack speed. So the more attack speed she has, the harder she's going to be to lock down. Items or champion's abilities that reduce attack speed are a dead set counter to Callista, as it will nullify her mobility and her damage at the same time. This is why some people love picking NASA support against Callista, just for his wither. CC really is the name of the game though. If you're in champion select, consider going for picks that don't really rely on skill shots, because if you lock in Lux support and Callista dodges your Q, she's going to farm you on repeat and snowball incredibly quickly. Callista's rend is where the majority of her damage comes from though. When she auto attacks you, she applies a stack of rend, which stacks up to 254 times. Yes, I did not make that number up, that is a lot of stacks. These stacks last for 4 seconds and she tops up that duration every time she attacks you and when she presses her E, she rips all lodge spears from her enemies to deal damage and slow them. You need to be careful she doesn't get too many stacks on you by auto attacking you down for free. Be cautious and try to get some space between you and her because if she pops that rend and you got a few too many stacks on you, it's seriously gonna hurt. Now Callista can actually reset the cooldown of this ability by killing a target with it. So what she'll often do is hop towards you, rend a minion and then rend you again to finish you off. Then she's also got her Q, which is another dash and skill shot damaging ability. Yet another way for her to gap close towards you and get on top of you. The crazy thing about Callista's Q though is that if it does kill an enemy, then it hits another one, it will transfer all current Ren stacks onto the second enemy it hits. This is honestly just a really unique mechanic and only the absolute best Callista players will actually be able to utilize this in game. But just be careful and remember that this mechanic does exist, because if that one time it does catch you off guard, you're going to get one shot out of nowhere. So Callista's aim of the game is to kill you early game and start snowballing, and she'll try and abuse her big early game damage with those Ren stacks. If she gets too cocky though, feel free to punish her mistakes, or instead, just play the game passively. Callista struggles in the later stages of the game in teamfights, where one tiny bit of CC is all it takes to completely remove her ability to actually play the game. So your most important priority is just don't give her unnecessary kills in the early game. If you're playing in the jungle or trying to roam as a support against Callista, also remember to watch out for those sentinels she sends out to scout nearby. These are really easy to bypass though, just make sure you're looking where your champion is pathing rather than just spectating on lanes as you move around the map. Finally, we also really do need to speak about Callista's ultimate which is actually such a versatile ability. She binds with an ally which is usually her support and she can press her ultimate to retrieve her teammates and hold them for 4 seconds. This will cleanse them from all CC and make them untargetable and invulnerable for that duration, but they won't be able to cast or move. This is not just an ability to save her teammates lives though, it can then be reactivated to send that support into an enemy team and set up a huge engage with the knocker. This ability can be insanely powerful in so many different ways. She can save her Soraka from certain death or she can send her Rel into a full 5 stacked enemy team. You're going to want to bait this ability out before throwing all of your major cooldowns on her teammate, only for her to save them. Or you can go for one better, just heavily focus the Callista instead and she won't be able to press R. Just remember, do not cluster up together and get slapped up by that knocker. The moral of the story is, don't int Callista early game, make sure you've got some reliable CC to lock her down and you'll be just fine. Let's take a look at the rat next. Wait, no, not that rat, the other one. Yes, that's better. Twitch has the ability to carry games like no other marksman with his unique roaming potential with that stealth. He scales into an ambushing AoE damaging demon in the late game, so let's see how you can beat him more often and prevent that from happening. Countering Twitch, just like a lot of other scaling AD carries, is about exploiting their vulnerability in the early game. And with no mobility, Twitch can genuinely be free kills if you get ahead of him. If you can force his summoner spells in those early levels, you can easily freeze him out of CS completely, or just kill him when he tries to come and get some experience. So by far the most iconic part of Twitch's kit is his stealth, which allows him to cheese his way through games. When he presses his Q, he turns invisible after a 1 second delay. During this time, he gains movement speed, which increases even more if he's chasing enemy champions. And then once he comes out of stealth, he gains bonus attack speed. If Twitch kills an enemy, his Q is reset. Twitch can use this in a variety of different ways. He can roam around the map and pick up stray kills. He can use this ability in lane by popping out of vision briefly and catching you off guard. And he can also come back after a reset, stealth back into lane and get the jump on you. When playing against Twitch, you always need to be thinking about where he could be. Every time he recalls, you want to be a little bit more careful and you want to warn your other lanes with a ping or two to say that he might be on his way. Control wards are going to be your best friends here so try and place them in lane brushes in deep jungle areas where he may look to roam. And a personal favourite of mine if you can get there is this cheeky little brush in between the two bot lane towers. Because if you know he's on the way, half the risk is gone instantly and they're probably not going to check it. 
Another huge part of Twitch's kit is his poison. Now this comes from his passive and stacks up to six times when he uses his auto attacks or his W to apply them. So if you are low on health after fighting Twitch, make sure to spam those potions to try and save your life. He can then press his E which deals more damage to enemies the more stacks of his passive he has on them. In lane, as soon as he has used his E though, he is now so easy to fight. So whenever he wastes it or uses it to farm, you should definitely be thinking about instantly trying to fight it. Then of course you've got the ability which gives Twitch the potential to destroy entire teams in the late game, his ultimate. This gives him a ton of range, bonus AD and AoE damage. These ultimate bolts apply on hit and can crit and they seriously do hurt. And if Twitch finds an angle to flank with his stealth and open up onto a team with his ultimate, he can clean up a whole team in seconds. When you see Twitch's R popped, either take him down super quickly or back the hell out of there and wait for it to time out. Avoid clustering together in small areas of the jungle and try to stay near a teammate with crowd control. They can be your rat deterrent for the game. At whatever stage in the game though, a Twitch without his ultimate is a much easier rat to exterminate. So as soon as he wastes it or whiffs it, you should be looking to engage on him the second you can, because he is no way near as threatening whilst it's on cooldown. To sum up, make sure you're buying those control wards. Try to punish Twitch early game as he has no mobility, and without flash, he can feel like a free kill. Play around his ultimate's cooldown and just be careful of that stealth. Let's move on to Misfortune next, and she's definitely one of the more basic AD carries in the game to play, hence why she's always been so popular at lower ranks. So first things first, the most recognisable part of Misfortune is of course her ultimate, and honestly, this is half the reason she remains viable or strong in any meta. All she's got to do is wait for that right moment, press R and watch her enemies melt. As soon as Misfortune hits level 6, remember that power spike this ability grants her. And if she's paired up with a CC heavy support, don't get locked down inside it as you'll simply get obliterated. Watch her level ups and be ready to flash or cleanse if you need to. Remember that your own CC will stop Misfortune's ultimate too, so it could be worth saving it for when she pops R. Throughout games, Misfortune will often look for choke points and angles to line up those big ultimates, so always be careful in areas you don't have vision of. She does have to stand still to cast this ability though, so if you have any dashes, consider flanking next to her and taking her down to either kill her or just force her to cancel that ultimate and deal with you instead. MF is also fairly oppressive in lane. She has her passive, her double up and her make it rain abilities, which can all be super annoying to play against. So let's quickly go over them so you can understand them better. Misfortune's passive Love Tap means she gains bonus damage whenever she hits a new target. This allows her to farm super easily even with low AD, but it also means she can constantly tap you in between minions to deal more damage and win more traits. Try to avoid free auto attacks from her while she's farming, and she may look to tap you in between CS to proc that passive for free damage. So instead, try to wait out for the right moments to commit on her instead. Misfortune's Q is the scary one though. She can execute a back minion and the projectile will then bounce to you behind it dealing tons of damage. Always be careful where you're standing and don't let this hit you, and if you see those caster minions low on HP, avoid them. Misfortune's W active is an attack speed steroid as well, so as soon as she either uses both of these two abilities, this is your best chance to fight her and take her down. Misfortune's E make it rain is the simple AoE slow that she often uses for poke. Now obviously you want to avoid this one and be careful she doesn't layer this on top of her ultimate, as you'll be slowed inside it, take loads of damage and yeah, you're probably going to die if you don't have flash. Keep an arm misfortunes mana in the lane phase though, because if she is spamming all of these abilities trying to fight you and she goes out of mana, this is going to be really easy kills for you and your support. Now aside from a bit of movement speed from her W's passive, she doesn't have any mobility or dashes, so you should be able to take her down easily if you do get on top of her. Misfortune is also much more burst focused rather than DPS, which means in duels and extended fights she's just not going to be as effective. So if you can catch her out 1v1 in a side lane, you're probably going to win the fight. In team fights, avoid stacking up too closely, avoid choke points, play the fights out, don't get bursted down and just turn it around on top of her when it suits you. Let's take a look at Tristana now, and she has the potential to snowball incredibly hard with her crazy early game damage, those W resets, and she can take out structures and opponents with ease. So Tristana's early game aggression is what you really need to watch out for, because if she does get fed, she honestly turns into a bit of a burst assassin. So let's break down her abilities and why she's so good here. Tristana's E is her bomb. Now she can place this on a target or to attack them a few times to increase its strength, and then it'll explode after either 4 hits or 4 seconds. This is where a lot of her early game burst damage comes from. Tristana can also use her bomb on turrets too, so watch out for that when you're being pushed in. Then you've got her Q, which is a simple attack speed steroid that allows her to proc and explode that bomb faster, dealing significantly more damage. Since she usually pops this together with her bomb, take a step back and go back in for her when you see her cannon cool down. 
Re-engaging when she's low on cooldowns and fighting on your own terms is key against Tristana. Then you've got Tristana's W which is her mobility, which resets upon champion takedowns, but it also resets when her bomb detonates, meaning she can actually use this super aggressively in combination with her burst. At level 3 she can jump on top of you, use her E and Q to detonate the bomb quickly and get another W reset. Then if she kills a target she gains another W reset to jump in again or back out to safety. Just like many other aggressive early game champions, be prepared for an early all in from her if she does get level 3 first. Tristana's rocket jump is easily preventable though if you have any form of CC. Lots of abilities can cancel that dash altogether and it's a great way to stop her from jumping in or even jumping out when she's trying to run away. A quick note if you are playing Blitzcrank though, when you use your hook Tristana can W out of it mid animation, but your E can cancel it instead. Generally Tristana's early game playstyle is to look to get some damage out in trades and then look to all in. If you pick champions that can outrange her and poke her down she's going to have a much harder time jumping on top of you for an engage because she's going to have a lot less HP and often not be in the position where she can risk overcommitting. Another thing about Tristana is that her E's passive deals splash damage to minions when she last hits them, meaning she will often passively shove lanes pretty often, so controlling the minion wave against Tristana can and should be used to your advantage. You can use this to keep the lane just outside your turret range and make her permanently gankable for your jungler. Obviously we can't forget about Tristana's ultimate which is a damaging ability with a juicy knockback. This is her form of self peel, but it also contributes hugely to her burst damage combos. She can either use this in combination with her all in to pop you down quickly, or she can save it and use it to protect herself in fights. Without this ability though she is much more vulnerable, so again make sure to try and punish her when it's down. It's also worth noting that with Tristana's ultimate she can push multiple enemies away from her if they clump up together, to try to spread out slightly so you don't all get sent back at the same time. Tristana may not be the best scaling AD carry in the game, but she does actually get more attack range the longer the game goes on, so make sure you keep that in mind as you progress into games. Throughout games Tristana will adopt a bursty in and out playstyle, but she does struggle against stacked up confined team fights where AoE CC can ruin her day and cancel her mobility. Avoid getting caught out in rotations as she can rocket jump on top of you and burst you down before you can even react. Stick near your teammates, keep to team fights and 5v5s and you should be fine. Cogmore is one of the scariest scaling long range health shredding monsters in League of Legends, so let's work out how you can stop him from becoming an absolute raid boss. Now firstly the main reason Cogmore shreds everybody is due to his W. This extends his auto attack range and makes him deal bonus magic damage on hit. You'll see when he activates his ability and it also has a sound cue, so in lane just back off and let it time out. Without his W though he is much easier to fight, so this is the fundamental way to play against him in the early game. Cogmore's Q is a little spitball that reduces your armor and MR, so if he hits this first, again, back off, wait it out and re-engage afterwards. You can also easily block the damage of this Q by sitting behind minions or your support. The range on this ability is much longer than you may think too, so watch out for it. His E is a path of ooze which slows you, so be careful getting caught in this while he's peppering you down at the same time. It is pretty obvious when he uses it though, so try and sidestep the damage and avoid the slow. Cogmore's ultimate is a pretty long range artillery ability that deals damage, however it absolutely rinses his mana, so if he's spamming it, watch his mana pool and force a fight whilst he's low on fuel. Do not forget about Cogmore's passive though, when you kill him he'll turn into a zombie gaining movement speed and after 4 seconds he'll explode dealing some juicy true damage. Be careful with this one, as he can easily trade one for one in those close early fights. And that's pretty much it for Cogmore's kit, it's all about timing and spacing, back off when his W is active and fight him every single time it's down. Just don't underestimate him in extended fights, keep it short and sweet, play around your burst and you should be just fine. Cogmore literally has no mobility whatsoever, so without flash he is a sitting duck, or pug should we say. Time is flash, land your CC and you can easily get ahead of him in the early game and remove his ability to scale into the rest of the game. Speaking of scaling, if Cogmore has an enchanter by his side in teamfights, he's going to need to be your priority. If you have reliable CC make sure you send it his way and if you ever get the chance to fight him without his support by his side, you should definitely take it. Up next we have Sivir who has always been one of the more consistent utility marksmen to go for, offering tons of wave clear and push potential but also having one of the best team wide ultimates for any AD carry. First up we've got her Q, which is her boomerang, that deals damage on the way out and on the way back in. If she hits you right on the tip it'll deal some hefty burst damage as it resets the damage modifier as it returns. If you learn to dodge this consistently you will start winning most trades and most lanes against Civit. 
Her W is what throws out those little bouncing blades throughout waves. Now she can use this as an auto attack reset and it grants her an attack speed boost. Simply stay a little bit out of the way of the wave to avoid free harass it and stall her attack speed steroid until after it finishes before you fight her. In the early levels though, she can really lack some damage and if she uses her Q and W too much to poke, she'll actually run out of mana really quickly too. This means if you look to trade and fight her often, she'll already be on the back foot as she'll have to decide whether to fight you or clear waves instead. Sivir's Spell Shield is one of the best defensive abilities in the game for any AD carry, and it pretty much does what it says on the tip, blocks any incoming ability after she presses it, and this lasts for 1.5 seconds. If she is successful in blocking an ability, she'll gain a small heal and activate her passive movement speed. Always be conscious of this Spell Shield, and don't just throw out your major abilities when she has this ability available. She'll often be saving it for those big cooldowns, so if you can bait it out beforehand with an engage or get your support to do it for you, then you can look to punish her when it's down. Remember though, it doesn't block auto attack so you can easily auto her for the duration and then throw your abilities out afterwards if you have the upper hand and you're healthy enough. Sivir is not the easiest AD carry in the game to punish as with her spell shield alongside her ultimate and summoner spell she has a lot of disengage but when you do get the chance when it's all down she doesn't have any dashes and she can be very easy to kill. Speaking of that ultimate this is one of the main reasons why Sivir will always be viable. She grants herself and her nearby teammates a huge movement speed boost so she can use this to engage or escape fights with her team. Be a little bit more careful than normal of your positioning when overextending in lane past level 6. And be mindful throughout games as she can enable her and her team to get on top of your team very quickly. For Sivir personally, when she presses R, she also gets another buff where her basic attacks reduce her abilities cooldowns. So it can also be worth kiting and waiting this out before looking to fight her specifically. Talking about fighting Sivir though, she's not the best duelist. She prefers to stick with her teammates throughout boomerangs and blades through teams and waves and keep on the back foot. So if you're playing an AD carry who's adept at dueling like Vayne or Kaiser, if you see the chance to force a 1v1 on Sivir, you should almost always take it. Finally, we've got Aphelios, who is arguably one of the most complex AD carries in the game, or at least he seems to appear so anyway. But really the key to countering Aphelios is honestly just understanding what on earth he actually does. So let's start off with the key part, those weapons, what they all do and what to expect. First off, he's got his sniper rifle. As you'd expect, this is his longest range weapon, which makes his auto attack range longer. When he presses his Q with this weapon, it'll fire a bolt in a line dealing damage and enabling him to hit you with his secondary weapon from super far away. All you really want to do though is block this Q with minions and allies if you need to and respect his extended attack range. Next up we've got the red one which is his scythe pistol. His attacks here are non-projectile and they heal him with every auto. If he presses Q he locks onto a nearby target and starts channeling, dealing damage and healing him. So try to interrupt him with some CC when he presses this or just get out of the way. Then we've got the purple gravity cannon which is his only form of crowd control. His basic attacks with this one will slow you and if he uses his Q he'll root you in place for one second. Be careful with this one as he can combine it with his support to chain CC you. However, once he has used his Q to CC you, he obviously can't use it again until it's back up, meaning that that purple weapon is pretty much done and dusted, which gives you the perfect window to fight him while it's on cooldown. Aphelios' blue weapon is his flamethrower and this is his AoE bursty wave clearing ability. His auto attacks will deal splash damage through the waves and hit you if you're standing behind them, so watch out for those. If he presses his Q, he'll deal a chunk of damage in a cone, so simply just outrange him here. And then finally, we probably have his best weapon, the white one, which is his Chakram. His basic attacks bounce between him and his target. He can't auto attack until they return, so if he's standing closer, he can get more damage off, and if he's further away, vice versa. When he presses his Q here, he'll deploy a sentry turret that will attack you with his offhand weapon. Kill that turret quickly or get out of the way, but be mindful of what he's got in his back pocket. So these weapons work in a queue system. Once he's used up all of his ammo with one weapon, it'll return to the back of the queue. And you can see how much ammo he's got left by looking underneath his health bar. This is a huge way on how you can counter him throughout all stages of any game. As a quick example, if you're in a matchup where the extra range from his sniper is going to be your biggest issue, wait until he's used up all the ammo for it. And then you have a huge window to win against him until that sniper comes back round again. Aphelios can conjure up plenty of different weapon combos that make him very versatile and unique to play against each time. But as long as you understand the basics of what those weapons do, you'll know when and how to fight them. As an example, his sniper and gravity cannon combo will give him long range and CC, 
granting him pick potential from a distance. His pistol and shakram will give him close range nuke and sustain. This particular combo is very dangerous, so consider waiting this one out. You've also got his pistol and flamethrower, which will give him huge close range AoE damage and burst. So be ready to dodge that ultimate with this combo. Speaking of that ultimate, this is his AoE nuking ability that has bonus effects based on each weapon. And all they do is amplify the strength of each unique weapon that we've already covered. Aphelios' ult animation and sound cue is pretty obvious, so you should have plenty of time to dodge or flash this most of the time. Just be extra careful in choke points, as if he does manage to land it on a whole team, it can decide the fight pretty quickly, especially if he's got the right weapon combo to follow up afterwards. The thing is, in lane, level 1 Aphelios is pretty damn weak, as he literally doesn't have an ability, aside from being able to switch between his weapons. Therefore, getting the jump on him at level 1, setting up a cheese in a brush, or just dishing out some poke and getting him to half health here, is a huge way to get the upper hand against him in lane. In team fights, Aphelios needs the right combos to perform optimally, so if you force a team fight when he's got a sniper and pistol, he is pretty much limited to single target damage, so in a 5v5 he's going to struggle to really do anything. If he's got blue and white available alongside his ultimate, that's going to be some serious AoE damage. Have a look at what weapons he's got and keep track of his ammo, and pick where and when you want to fight him. The same applies to 2v2s really. Check his weapons, watch his ammo underneath his health bar, watch his mana usage, and if you ever see a chance where he's really punishable, just go for it and fight him. In this clip, you can see that Aphelios has low mana, he's got his long range and CC combo, and Zeri and Yumi have got their huge level 6 power spike. All the perfect signs to go for an all-in. Aside from all this complicated weapon stuff and intricate combos and mechanics, Aphelios has no dashes and no mobility whatsoever, especially if he doesn't have a Gale Force or if it's on cooldown. This means if you do manage to get on top of him and lock him down with a bit of CC and burst, he's going to do absolutely nothing and have no way of staying alive. Try not to overthink all this weapon stuff, and just remember, he's an AD carry with no escape. So just like anyone else, time is flash and punish him for it. He really does work best when he fights on his own terms, so if you never give him the chance to set up those weapons and line up big ultimates, you can remove his ability to play the game how he wants to, and therefore shut him down each and every time. Well that brings us to the end of this video explaining each and every AD carry in the game and how you can improve your chances of beating them all. We put a fair bit of time into this one so we hope you all found it helpful and hope that along the way you may have learned something new. Don't forget to check out Mobilitics whilst you're here and download our desktop app. On there you can see more in-depth champion information like AD carries builds and runes but also you can break down each marksman and see which picks are best against every single one, making your chances of beating them even better. Thanks again for watching guys and we'll see you all next time. Take care.